The armed robbery was in progress in a cash exchange bureau in London. And at some point during this robbery, a member of the staff uh, sounded the alarm and actually got out of the premises along with most of the others. But that left the robber trapped inside with a weapon, which actually turned out to be a loaded weapon, with what looked to be some form of explosive device. And he had the manageress of the exchange bureau captive, and she is now a hostage. The police had put a cordon around the premises, and some of those police officers were specialist armed officers because of the weapon that had been seen. The streets were being closed off. It was beginning to attract all sorts of publicity. It was a sunny day. Sounds extremely dangerous to me, sort of straight out of Hollywood film. So what were you asked to do and how were you feeling? It was extremely dangerous, but mainly because he's armed. And I know that sounds obvious, but I mean, it's even more dangerous because this is not this man's plan. By now, he should have, in his mind, he is long gone with cash. He's probably panicking. He's probably extremely frightened. He's looking out of the big plate glass window at armed police and he's stuck. So he has no plan B. So he is very, very dangerous at this particular point. How was I feeling? Well, when I got the call, and I'm not going to lie, you feel very anxious. Your adrenaline is flowing like you wouldn't believe. You know you're going to an armed incident. What was I asked to do? Well, it sounds a bit flippant, but I was asked to get him to come out without harming anybody, including himself. Oh, easy task. Yeah, yeah, simple. I'm Martin Richards, and that's Chris White, and we are hostage and crisis negotiators. And we've got a combined 40 years experience. Uh, And this is another part of a series of podcasts called Convincing Conversations where we want to help you, whatever your situation or background, to have a better and a more effective conversation with people around you. And you're probably now thinking how a trapped armed man in a bank in central London is going to help you have a better, more productive conversation. Mm. Well, as with all our podcasts, we share with you some of our experiences the scenarios we get called to, to give you a flavour of the variety of encounters that Chris and I have experienced. And today, we're going to introduce ways of reducing the stress of others in highly emotional conversations. Getting to a point where we can actually really listen and be listened to. So we can move the situation, the conversation forward, however unlikely it may seem. To reduce the stress in others, we need to identify what basic needs are missing and then address them in the conversations that we have. And by the end of this podcast, you will understand how we all have some basic human needs. And when we don't have them met, it can cause stress. And that in turn impacts on our conversations and our ability to listen. So you'll have tips on how to meet those needs and better plan or react to the difficult conversations when emotions are running high. Because this in turn will help you build rapport and could allow you more opportunities to maybe influence others. So Chris, what are your immediate concerns with this bank robber? Uh, Well, the immediate concern is the safety of all concerns. So I do not want this bank robber to commit reckless acts. Um, You know, I I don't, uh, I don't want that. I don't want him shooting anybody. I don't want him harming anybody else. And I don't want him harming himself. Mm -hmm. Um, Because clearly, you know, we have a duty to everybody in this situation. So I don't want this getting out of control. And it's highly, highly emotional at this point. But when people are feeling stressed or panicky, which he almost certainly was, they are more likely to act recklessly. They're certainly less likely to listen to us. I mean, we we know that from our own experiences. Because when experiencing really intense emotions, people can't listen. They can't be persuaded. I mean, think about it, Martin. We've all been there. You know, we, we none of us go through life without getting emotional around things. It's perfectly natural. And in other podcasts, we talk about conversation structures and how to identify and talk about emotions. But when we're highly emotional, 
-hmm. we're not ready to listen we're not we're not listening because there's too much there's too much noise going on in our body in our brain uh sometimes actually physically going on because stress affects us physically so we're not ready to listen and be persuaded and i think you know you, you know you know that um and so this is that was my immediate concern so the the very basics kick in when we're overwhelmed with stress and you you've heard of the fight flight or freeze thing that happens more often than not with people now the important thing about that is you you might think that that's kind of a physical response to a physical threat and it is but of course that also really applies to how you converse mm -hmm. with other people. We all know people that always seem to fly off the handle at the slightest provocation. And those conversations very quickly just become about winning. They deviate from what the conversation is about or was about, and they become about winning, hammering the point until you win. And we all know people like that. So my bank robber at the moment is ticking all the boxes his basic needs almost exclusively were just not being met. So what are these basic needs then? Well, we all need at some point in our lives, we all need certain things. We, we need things like a sense of control in our lives. Now, to be clear, some, some people very unfortunately go through their whole lives and never get their basic needs met. And these are people that struggle in society. But, you know, the, the fortunate ones amongst us do get them met most of the time. We all need a sense of control. We all like to feel certain about certain aspects of our lives. We don't like uncertainty everywhere. Some uncertainty can be exhilarating, but we don't like a lack of it everywhere. A sense of belonging, whether it's family, football clubs, hobbies, friends, a sense of safety that we can carry on doing the things we like to do without being threatened. And something that we've mentioned many times and will continue to do so, our self-esteem is important, mm. our sense of dignity and self-esteem. So this bank robber, let's go through him. He would have had a lack of certainty about what might happen to him. He mm -hmm. would be worried about his own safety because he's looking at police officers, some of whom are pointing weapons at him. Examples of how reduction in these can manifest itself is anxiety, fear, anger. There's the, fl there's the fight. This, this bank robber probably thought everything I said was a trick because he's fearful. Um, you know, we're trying to trick him. I'm not being honest. He's anxious, fearing that the police are going to come into the premises and arrest him while he's talking to me. He was very angry at someone or something caused by his actions. His actions. He's probably angry at the situation <clears throat> that he finds himself in. So all those needs for him at right now are not being met. You mentioned anger. That's an interesting one, you know, because it impacts on the giver and the receiver we can become immobile and unable to speak which is the frozen you talked about it's sort of like a stunned shock when someone mm. you know shouts at you or becomes threatening you know picture yourself being confronted by a tirade of abuse and anger you know without realizing it actually your pulse rate increases your blood pressure will raise your pupils will dilate you will sweat more. Now, at that point, it's really hard for you to actually say anything, let alone have a meaningful dialogue with anybody. And you've, cause you're fearing for your safety and you don't know how people are going to react to you. So therefore, you've got a lack of certainty. So your basic needs are being threatened by this person who's yelling abuse at you. So you have to remember your own basic needs and how that can affect your own communication. I mean, you said you were feeling anxious when yeah. you arrived. If you're feeling a lack of control or certainty or you're tired or you're exhausted or you're in a bad mood or, as you say, anxious, you may have less patience. You may rush to judgments. You may not have the energy to actually listen to anybody. So it's important also to address your own basic needs and give yourself a good talking to, you know, identify what's missing, you know, with you and address them. So back to your bank robber then, you know, what did you say to him? You've identified that he's got a, he, he thinks the police are going to come in. He doesn't believe what you're saying to him. So his safety, his certainty, his sense of control was missing. What did you say to him then to reduce his stress levels 
and address those basic needs to get him on a more even keel. What I tried to do was to reflect back to him some of these things. So, for example, he may have been thinking the police were going to storm the premises and arrest him or worse. Mm. I said, whilst you're talking to me, whilst you're not harming anybody, the police will not come into that premises. Or, you know, we can move this forward together again while you're talking to me and whilst I'm talking to you, we can move this forward together. You know, you are making the decisions right now inside that premises. You have responsibility for somebody's welfare inside that premises. I think I did say, you know, you're in charge inside. You're dictating what's going on inside the premises. So by saying some of those things, I'm giving him certainty that nobody's coming in. I'm giving him recognising to a certain degree his control i mean there was you know all the time reinforcing while you're not harming because that would take it out of my control you know a sense of um, self-esteem you're in charge you you can make decisions about what's going on in there uh, a sense of belonging you know it's me and you you know we're in this together and we can move forward together so so there's at least three or four basic needs that i'm beginning to hopefully uh, meet for him or allow to be met for, you know, in his particular circumstance at that time. And then ultimately, he'll feel less stressed. Exactly. And then, yeah, and then you're able to hopefully move forward with slightly more meaningful dialogue mm. um, because, you know, he, he just feels, he feels slightly more secure in what I've said. And some people need to be persuaded to talk about their concerns and emotions and we often sense that they want to but they're fearful of the consequences if they do and and part of this as you mentioned is is self-esteem you know a lack of belief in themselves thinking what's the point in in talking about this but there are ways of actually listening to the words people use so we can then identify what basic needs are lacking so let's put this in a workplace scenario. Then let's let's leave your bank robber alone for a moment. Here I am, Chris. I'm one of your team. Do you know I failed promotion again? I'm not getting the roles I'm applying for. I'm actually feeling pretty down about this, and I don't know what to apply for next. Uh, my career's all over the place. And in fact, they've even said they may cancel the promotion process next year. All right. So, Martin, in that situation... Your, I think you'd agree that your self-esteem is low and requires building. You know, you've had a plan. Uh, you may have even have been thinking about the consequences of the success of that plan and it hasn't happened. Mm -hmm. So I might praise your performance at work, for example, your achievements in your private life, if I, if I know you well, your bravery in actually saying how you're uh, feeling. You might be feeling you've got no control or certainty about your career path or future promotion. So I'm, I'm going to be exploring... Uh, other avenues, lateral development, for example, extracurricular courses, something that's going to build your skills base so that you're even better when the promotion or, or whatever process there might be in your particular workplace begins to open up. And by facilitating some of that as a member of my team, one, I'm showing what I hope is good leadership, but I'm also going as I said, I've used the phrase before, I'm not doing anything to you. I'm doing things with you to actually rebuild that sense of confidence so that you're in a better place when when you, we can um, you know, start looking for different roles once again. So I'm giving you back some control, some, some certainty about where you're moving forward, giving you some ownership and investment in what you're going to do. And hopefully by doing that, reduce some of the stress caused by what you currently see as a failure. I wish you were my boss, Chris. <laughs> I would happily be your boss, Martin. Uh, I wouldn't let you, actually. <laughs> no, I know you wouldn't. It's good. Going back to your bank robber, was, was there a host you, I think you mentioned there was a hostage inside. There was, yes. Um, I shall call her Sarah, not her real name. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, given what we've just said, her basic needs are properly compromised, severely. You know, a lack of safety. No certainty, no control. She's at the complete whim and, um, you know, any at the behest of this particular individual. So her basic needs aren't being met at all here. She's not, in, obviously, not in a good place. I mean, it must have been terribly frightening for her, as I sort of discovered 
um, during the course of that quite lengthy incident. And also th- there's a comparison here between hostages, people being held against their will, and think back to us in lockdown. That's an interesting example. I mean, I'm sure you felt, you know, even up to now, but certainly last year in 2020, I'm sure you felt stressed in lockdown because we couldn't do the things we wanted to do. And if you look at some of the needs that were not being met, I'm sure you felt stressed. I know I did in certain areas and I'm lucky, probably not as stressed as, uh, as Sarah would have, but still stressed. Um, and, and we know because of the work we've done with with certain sectors and areas of, of our business that hostages who manage to maintain or regain some of their basic needs when they're in captivity are more likely to cope and recover quicker. So what sort of things then did you say to Sarah so she felt less stressed? Well, generally, we're, we're taught as negotiators when we're working with people who might be going to risky places, advise people to eat the food they're given. And in fact, that happened. Uh, she was given uh, food and drink. And in longer term situations to exercise and look after their physical well-being, not to antagonize captors, which sounds an obvious one, but you can do that, you know, inadvertently to say that their families love them, you know, personalize themselves, emphasize the sense of belonging, to think of and maintain a routine, however mundane that routine is, to keep busy. So the control and certainty aspect um, that you do have some ownership about what's going on, albeit you are in a very, very difficult and dangerous situation. And, and in that case, it was more short term, so not applicable to everybody. But I certainly said, you know, obviously assuming that he could hear what I was saying, try and keep a level head, try and think of family and friends, believe in me and what's going on outside to to get you out and home safely. There's lots of people working on your behalf to get you out. So there's the belonging thing. This is going to continue until such time as we get you home safely. Think of positive thoughts. Accept any food and drink. And as I said, she was given coffee and and a sandwich, I think. might have been a biscuit or something. And it may not seem a lot, but it goes a long way in reclaiming some control and therefore giving people a structure and reducing the stress that they're going through at that particular time. And as you said, there's a lot of echoes there with advice to people in lockdown. Exactly the same. I mean, I remember opening up a lot of social media articles in newspapers from psychologists, all basically saying the same thing. And the advice they were Mm. giving was to enable people to get back their basic needs. Find a routine, keep yourself fit, don't drink too much, start a hobby, try and manage your family relations, you know, understand that everybody within that family unit is also stressed because your basic needs are threatened during lockdown. You're asking yourself, when's it going to end? So there's your lack of certainty. The Mm. government are restricting your behavior. So there's your lack of control. You know, you can't go out and meet people. You can't do your hobbies outside what they used to do. Can't meet up with your family and friends. So your belonging is um, is suffering. You might actually get COVID and become very unfit. So there your physical Mm -hmm. needs are being affected. And that is why we were all stressed in lockdown. Mm -hmm. Knowing we have to address the needs of ourselves and others to minimize stress. It makes sense for for us, I know, to plan for those important conversations. So if we have time and it's an important conversation, why not plan for it? You know, there are many things that we plan in our daily lives, but I bet very few people actually plan a conversation. Now, remember, we we mentioned it's about our own needs as as well as reducing the stress in others. So you as my supervisor being presented with the low self-esteem scenario, you know that empathy and active listening is required. So it's important to make sure that you are rested, your physical needs are catered for before the conversation, Have you got the energy? Is there any cognitive bias present? 
Mm-hmm. And, you know, in that workplace scenario, and in fact, with your bank robber, both parties, you and the other person, need some control and certainty in the conversation. Now, I know in hostage negotiation, we take breaks, we go away and reflect, we clear our thoughts, and then we plan in detail the next part of that conversation. What are we going to say? What might they say? What's our contingencies? You know, we agree boundaries and expectations. Even if everyone of those conversations at home or you're having it at work, try it, you know, agree. What are you going to expect to get out of the conversation? Are there any parameters you're going to set? And these then will address the control and certainty needs. And if you both are feeling stressed or anxious, you won't listen to each other properly. Mm. And in, in those important conversations when you're dealing with people in a crisis, you won't identify the hooks that you need to identify. And you might misunderstand people. And you may even come across as unempathetic, which is a big no-no, mm. as you know, in the mm. negotiator yeah. world. Too right. And if I'm about to speak with a team member or a colleague who wants to have a chat over a coffee as they are experiencing some stress at home, for example, mm. I will plan. And I might want to establish, if I can, before the discussion, you know, things like the purpose of the conversation that you're going to have, the contents of the conversation, any boundaries that might present difficulties, previous conversations you know, who with, what was said, what was promised, what was carried out or delivered. Previous information and advice that's been that's been passed on from an external body, for example. You know, what information is out there in the public domain already? You know, what do I need to be very careful with? Um, all those things will help me have a, a just, just a better exchange with that person. Yeah, and, and another reason to address these basic needs and reduce the stress is because many conversations can present a risk. And in our case as negotiators, often the risk is a physical one. Um, I mean, your guy there armed and with an explosive device, it's obvious. Those people we talk to who are armed that we have to negotiate with in hostile environments, we plan to mitigate those risks. So what did you do with your bank robber to mitigate risks? Well, whatever we could which included bearing in mind that i am in dialogue with him on and off for quite a long time so i'm getting information and we looked at you know any kind of history assuming he was who who he said he was you know whether it was being broadcast in the media whether he'd been negotiated with before because that happens uh, what the demands were, etc. To deal with the physical risk, we made sure we were out of harm's way. Actually, I was not face to face with him. Mm. Um, armed police officers were, but I was actually on the telephone, which removes that personal contact, contact and makes it even more, more challenging and more difficult. The members of the public were kept well back, but there were inevitably people taking pictures and on rooftops because, you know, this is all very exciting to look at. And everybody that was concerned from emergency services was properly protected, wearing the right protective clothing, and ultimately there was armed support on that particular scene as well. In fact, there was even a sniper on one of the buildings because at this point we weren't sure that whether there was uh, whether the explosive device was real or otherwise. So some pretty extreme measures were put in place. Um, to keep the environment outside this building safe. Wow. Now, this bank robber, though, I mean, it's an extreme case, and there are risks to health, but there's also risks to relationships as well in conversations. I mean, how many times, Chris, Mm. have you had a conversation with someone that, that you know and the relationship was damaged and never actually recovered afterwards? Never. Never happened to me. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I, I wish I could say. I wish I could say that with truth, but now I know exactly what you mean. Well, how about this one then? Have you ever chosen not to have a conversation with a loved one because of the risk to your relationship or a possible argument that you didn't actually have the energy to cope with? You knew it was going to go down the wrong way, so you decided not to have the conversation. Yeah, yeah many times. <laughs> many times. I can identify with that one, whether it's time, place, mood, feelings, whatever, mm. but yes. Classic example of this scenario is your best friend has found a new partner. You think they're really bad for them. 
you think you need to say something to your best friend, but they're so happy in that relationship that if you go there, they're probably going to choose you or that new partner. So it's too risky. Mm. So you decide not yeah. to have the conversation uh, and you hope they break up uh, in the future. <laughs> so part of the planning is to actually pick the right time and the environment, you know, ensure the person's not under the influence of drugs, they're not too tired, um, they haven't had too much to drink. I mean, is face-to-face -face better than text, for example? Choose how you have the conversation. So worst case scenario is last thing at night, everyone's had a few drinks, you've had a long day at work, the other person's got lots of people around them who agree solely with their position. This is not going to be a good conversation for you to have. So you're bank robber then, Chris. What happened? Well, it was an interesting one, Martin, because, I mean, I think this lasted, I can't remember the exact times, but let's say 15, 16 hours or something. It was, it was hours in length. So not the longest hmm. siege, for want of a better expression. But going right back to the beginning, it was, you know, th when I said this, this was not his plan. And during the course of that, he did show some compassion um, for the manageress that he was holding hostage. He did was not displaying at any time a great desire to cause harm to her, which sounds weird because as it happened, the explosive device was not genuine. It was not an explosive device, but the, the gun that he had certainly was real and loaded. Um, so there he is with the means to kill, but he actually didn't display the the behaviours, if you like, that he wanted to cause her harm. Eventually, he surrendered his weapon. One of the most difficult times was a point, bear in mind I couldn't see him, a point at which I thought that he may come out of this building actually pointing his weapon at armed police officers. Um, you know, we, we call that suicide by cop because mm. obviously they quite rightly would have felt their lives were in danger or somebody else's was and they'd have had to have dealt with that situation. Mm. And that was really quite a scary moment. And there was a lot of silence then when he was thinking about what he was going to do because he knew by that time that he was going to be arrested and going to prison for a long time. I mean, any right-minded right person could see that was a, you know, a highly likely outcome. And he began talking about self-harm because he didn't want to go back to prison. So, you know, we talk about self-esteem and those kind of things. I mean, that, that was a very difficult period of the negotiation. In the end, he released the hostage, he put his weapon out, and he did come out and surrendered himself to the police. Um, and he was arrested. And clearly in our role, I had no further contact with him after that particular point. But it was what I can only describe as a satisfactory outcome because nobody actually got hurt. Well done. 15 hours. Pfft, long one. I, I, think it was, I think it was about that. Might have been a bit less, might have been a bit mm. more. It was long enough to, be, to go through a whole roller coaster of situations and emotions mm. with him. Good job. Thank you. So let's summarise then. So what we talked about were well, two important things to remember – Above anything else for me is reducing the stress in others by addressing their basic needs and taking time to plan for those important conversations will make them more effective. But also remember that people are often emotional because they have a lack of their basic needs and your own basic needs should be addressed before you enter into any emotional important conversation. And for those important conversations and where you've got the time, plan for it to reduce the risks to the relationship or in extreme circumstances, health. Wow. Powerful stuff, Martin. I'm Chris White and that's Martin Richards on the Convincing Conversations podcast today. We've been talking about reducing the stress in others and ourselves so your conversations can be more effective and how to plan for those conversations that you know are important. If you like what you've heard today and found it interesting, please do go and leave us a review wherever you get your podcast from and share it with your friends and that might help them have better conversations too because it really does all make a difference.